Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we focus on how to best safeguard your health in the face of the assaults from radiation and environmental toxins, such as our spewing out from the Porter Ranch site in the Los Angeles area, from improper or illegal landfills of radioactive material, such as that at Westlake in North St. Louis and elsewhere. We'll hear general holistic health protection protocols for toxic exposure from Dr. Diane Sandler, a doctor of oriental medicine and a craniosacral therapist who has been practicing in the San Fernando Valley for three decades. And you'll hear specific radiation safeguard steps you can take from Kimberly Roberson, a certified nutrition educator, former Greenpeace nuclear campaigner, and the founder of the Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network. Plus, our popular Numbnuts of the Week feature, Nuclear Reactor Duck and Cover Report, activist shout-outs, and more honest nuclear information than is allowed if you're qualifying for the Boy Scouts Eagle Scout Radiation Badge. All of this coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, January 26, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Starting off in the U.S. with the duck <coughs> and cover report. Super snowstorm Jonas wrecked havoc with the nuclear industry this past weekend. Millstone in Connecticut, hot standby. <coughs> Calvert Cliffs in Maryland, hot standby. <coughs> Catawba in South Carolina, loss of emergency assessment capability. <coughs> First Energy Perry plant in Ohio experienced a reactor shutdown due to unidentified leakage in the dry well. <coughs> Fitzpatrick in upstate New York shut down because slushy lake water clogged an intake structure. <coughs> and Riverbend in Louisiana is still shut down since it got struck by lightning on January 9th. <coughs> In Washington State, an employee at the Hanford Fire Station has tested positive for internal radioactive contamination. The employee was reportedly exposed after breathing equipment used at the nuclear reservation's plutonium finishing plant was sent to the station for storage. That's right, just a piece of equipment from Hanford sent to the local fire station. Now, more than 100 of the Hanford Fire Department's 150 workers have requested tests of their bodily fluids to see if they also may have been exposed. In North St. Louis, residents around the burning Bridgeton Landfill with the underground fire adjacent to the Westlake Landfill, which has 175,000 tons of World War II-era Manhattan Project waste illegally buried and in the path of that fire... Where was I in that sentence? Oh, yeah, it's the residents. They're going to be subject to a new study by the St. Louis County Health Department to determine if they have a higher rate of certain health problems compared to the population elsewhere in the county or state. So what are they looking at? Asthma, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, and allergy-type symptoms, but not cancer. They're focusing on residents in a two-mile radius around the landfill, and say that the study won't attempt to show a link between the underground landfill fire and health problems, just whether the rate in the area is higher. That's right, why pay for lab rats when the human experiment has been going on for years? And on Saturday, February 22nd, the St. Louis Community College in Wildwood will present a symposium, The Adams Next Door, which will feature Nobel Peace Prize nominee Dr. Helen Caldicott, it will focus on nuclear waste and its consequences in Missouri and beyond. Speaking of beyond, two stories on nuclear waste removal. The first on the fact that states lack rules for radioactive drilling waste disposal, meaning the radioactive byproducts of the fracking process, 
And the other is that the U.S. Department of Energy is trying to change the rules on nuclear waste disposal to let states volunteer to take it in. Come on down. We'll give you jobs, guys. Links to both stories will be up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com, under this episode, number 24. And now... Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, Nuclear Hot Seat, none that's out of the week. Pandora's evil promise is being fulfilled, and it's happening much more quickly than anyone expected. First, the State of New York Public Service Commission ruled that non-carbon-emitting generation resources in the state's clean energy standard portfolio must include nuclear power plants. Then, on virtually the same day, in Washington State, a bill that would promote nuclear power in Washington as a clean power source passed out of a Senate committee and is on its way to the House. That legislation would require any state plan submitted to the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency related to its clean power plan or any rule adopted by the state under the federal plan, provide for the use of nuclear generation to the maximum extent allowed. This is the start of the payoff for the evil public relations campaign that has been waged to convince everyone that nuclear is a green energy source when it leaves behind radioactive waste that contaminates people and the environment for hundreds of thousands of years with no place to store it, no way to mitigate it, no way to neutralize it. But it's invisible, so hey, don't worry your pretty little head about it. Just go over to his side, get cancer, and die. New York State should know better than this, but Washington? Are we surprised that the home state of Microsoft and Bill Gates is dancing to his pro-nuclear tune? The nuclear industry has been spending millions upon millions of dollars in public relations to convince all of us that nuclear is green. And the definition of public relations is the manufacture of consent. The politicians who have fallen for this are not herding the lemmings to the sea. They are the Judas goats, leading us all to our demise and thinking they are immune from the consequences when they are not. Nobody is. The weapons-grade plutonium that is a waste product from nuclear energy generation has a half-life of 24,000 years and is dangerous to our DNA forever. And that's why the politicians of New York and Washington State who have allowed things to progress this far and any other politicians who may be thinking about allowing this to move forward in a nuke is green context are this week's and every week's nuclear hot seat, none that's out of week. Condolences to us all on the passing of Concepcion Piccolotto the protester who maintained a peace vigil outside the White House for more than three decades. Connie, as she was known, was the primary guardian of the anti-nuclear proliferation vigil staged along Pennsylvania Avenue, which she joined in 1981. She was 80 years old. And we'll post a link to Harvey Wasserman's EcoWatch article on how documents say the Navy knew Fukushima was dangerously contaminated when the USS Reagan sailed into the hottest of the radiation plume immediately after the disaster there began on March 11 of 2011. In Japan, the powers that be are flogging Fukushima sake, and they've got the YouTube videos to prove it. Meanwhile, TEPCO, Tokyo Electric Power Company, has announced that of 106 samples of fish caught 20 kilometers, 12 and a half miles, away from the site of the ongoing Fukushima nuclear disaster. Radioactive cesium was found in 43 samples, meaning 40.5% of all the fish. And in a new metric of radioactive contamination, wild monkey poops from Namie City in Fukushima had more than 150,000 becquerels per kilogram of radioactive cesium-137 and 134. In France, one person died and another was left seriously injured after a landslide at a planned underground nuclear waste site. And in Canada, 
Stop the Great Lakes nuclear dump has delivered 184 resolutions representing 22 million people to the Minister of the Environment and Climate, as well as Prime Minister Trudeau and the federal cabinet. All call for the rejection of Ontario Power Generation's application to build an underground deep geologic repository for radioactive nuclear waste within one mile of the shores of Lake Huron. We'll have our featured interviews in just a moment, but first, it's official. I'm going to St. Louis for the February 20th Symposium on Nuclear Waste and Occupational Illness, a.k.a. the Westlake Landfill Bridged in Fire Cold Water Creek Radiation Contamination Mess. I'm looking forward to meeting the brave activists, several of whom you've heard interviewed on this show, and in hearing what Dr. Helen Caldicott will be saying about this horrific situation. She is coming in from Australia for this event. I'm going ahead on purchasing the plane ticket, but I need your help to pay for it, as well as the other costs associated with this trip. Nuclear Hot Seat operates on donations from you, the listeners, and now would be a really great time for you to show your support for the work that we do. Give what you can. No amount is insignificant. Many listeners donate the equivalent of one cup of Starbucks coffee a month, and it is the best cup of coffee I never drink. I will be applying all incoming funds to this coming trip. So if you thought about helping to support the show, now would be a terrific time. You can donate to Nuclear Hot Seat by going to NuclearHotSeat.com and clicking on the big red Donate button. You can use PayPal, your credit or debit card, or for the less technologically trusting among us, you can email info at nuclearhotseat.com and we will send you back a snail mail address where you can send your donation the old-fashioned way. Whatever you can do to help get me to St. Louis so I can get the stories and bring them back to you. Many thanks. Porter Ranch, an upscale neighborhood on the edge of the San Fernando Valley in Los Angeles, has been continuously spewing out massive quantities of methane, benzene, and other contaminants, including radioactive radon, since a break in an underground pipe on October 23, 2015. The leak has been called by Aaron Brockovich the greatest environmental disaster since the BP oil spill. She must have been referring to continental United States because she left out Fukushima. The amount of gas released in a day is the equivalent of what would fill the inside of the Empire State Building, and the impact on the health of local residents has been devastating. Over 3,000 people have already been relocated to get them as far away as possible, but many are still there because they are either unwilling or unable to move. But this kind of pollution does not stay in one place. It's impacting residents of the San Fernando Valley, and perhaps even my neighborhood, which is only 20 miles away. What can someone concerned about their health do to best safeguard themselves, their loved ones, even their pets? That's what we will be looking at from a radiological as well as a toxic chemical perspective. As we begin, understand that the material that follows in today's show is presented as an information resource only and is not to be used or relied upon for any diagnostic or treatment purposes or to be construed as medical advice. This information should not be used as a substitute for professional diagnosis and treatment. If you are experiencing any symptoms of exposure to toxins or radiation or suspect you are at risk, seek immediate medical assistance by calling 911, going to your hospital's emergency room, or consulting with your primary care doctor or other appropriate medical professional. I repeat, the following is provided as information only. Dr. Diane Sandler is a doctor of oriental medicine and a craniosacral therapist who has been practicing in the San Fernando Valley for more than three decades. Her focus has been to support her patients in co-creating optimum health through lifestyle changes and deep core work that lead to cellular change. Dr. Diane Sandler, thank you so much for joining us today on Nuclear Hot Seat. I'm happy to be with you. Dr. Sandler, when a person is exposed to environmental toxins, what are the dangers they face? If it's airborne, which that's what we're talking about, then 
you're going to be breathing it in, so you're worried about your lungs and the barrier system of the body. We have our respiratory system, we have a blood-brain barrier, we have an intestinal wall, and we have our skin. Toxins will affect different people different ways. One of the main things that can happen is headaches. Some people, maybe their lungs are weaker, so they'll have a respiratory problem or sinus problems or shortness of breath. If it's a neurological system, they could get busy. It could affect their eyes. Skin, they might get some kind of hives. You can have other problems in your body show up that seem unrelated. Suddenly you have aches and pains in places that you never did before. People can have all kinds of unusual symptoms that don't fit any form. They don't fit anybody's list of a disease with a name and a treatment and a medicine for it. So it's scary and frustrating to people. And then it could affect them emotionally because it's just so upsetting that they get nervous or they get stressed or there's a myriad of ways, so many different symptoms that a person can have depending on their own immune system, how sensitive they are, what their age is, whether they're already sick, whether they're very old. We all have sort of our own ability to deal with chemicals and so You can be going along okay, and then all of a sudden you have no chemical tolerance anymore. You become one of these people that becomes dizzy if you smell perfume. You become very sensitive. So there's many, many ways, and it's all different. So in a population, one person can get a rash, another person can get headaches, another person can just be upset, somebody else, maybe they get sick of their stomach. There's so many ways. What would be a basic holistic protocol that could be followed by people exposed to intense levels of environmental pollutants, such as the residents of Porter Ranch are facing, or people in the San Fernando Valley, as well as those exposed to radioactivity from whatever source it might be coming from? You have to support your immune system the very best you can, so you you avoid exposure if you can. You would use air filters, and then you want to use Antioxidants to help you with getting rid of the toxins that you've ingested or breathed in. Toxins are either water-soluble or oil-soluble. You would maybe take vitamin C. You'd eat lots of foods that are colorful so that you can have antioxidants. You would eat correct oils, maybe use vitamin E because to help with the oil-soluble toxins. You would want to have a really high quality of an oil, like with a high level of DHA, so that you can protect your brain, your brain and your blood-brain barrier, because the blood-brain barrier needs oil to be strong and to to heal. You would avoid inflammatories wherever you can. So foods that cause inflammation, like sugar, gluten, corn, soy, dairy. If you want to get further than that, then you start researching for specific products to support you. But what I've mentioned is just kind of basic lifestyle changes. And then you have to do your best to avoid being panicked, which is a challenge because when your emotions go up and down, you disable your immune system by that stress. It's a big shock to have Porter Ranch be facing the same kind of problems that Flint, Michigan is. We don't know who's going to fix this, who's in charge of it, who's going to pay for it. So it's scary, and people can get panicked, and then their immune systems are going to be challenged by their emotional response, which is enough to knock their health down all by itself. It's really important for people to breathe in and breathe out and be grounded and do their best to support themselves in any way they can to stay sane and balanced. So it's a journey you have to go on to educate yourself and take actions that you can take and then do your best. You can't go crazy or you'll hurt yourself with your own emotions. You live in the San Fernando Valley, and that's also where your practice is, though you're not in close proximity to Porter Ranch. You are in the valley. What, if any, steps have you taken as regards your home and your pets? Well, I'm turning on my very noisy air filters, which I don't like to use, but I'm going to use. I have birds, so I will not be putting them outside in their cages. They have indoor cages, and I'll keep them inside. 
I'm going to increase the amount of vegetables I'm eating. I'm going to do exactly what I just told everybody else to do. Try to get good sleep. Drink more water, a little bit more water than usual. You try to dilute toxins with water so that you just keep flushing them out. What benefit do you feel acupuncture or other holistic protocols might have? What kind of impact might they have on people's health? through this kind of an exposure crisis? Primarily strengthening the immune system and helping somebody be grounded so that they can face what they have to face. Something like acupuncture or massage or the kind of work I do, cranial sacral therapy, something that will assist their nervous system to stay out of fight or flight, calm down, be able to nurture, digest their food, and get some sleep. In some cases, if they are already have symptoms, then herbs and supplements can help with the symptoms. And is this something they can self-diagnose, or is it important to go see a practitioner who can help you get really specific? I think people will do what they can do. If you have the option, you know who to go to, you can afford it, you have time, it would be a wonderful priority to set for yourself because you'll do better if you have professional support than you will if you just go and Google something. But people just need to do the common sense actions, the common sense things first, eating right and avoiding increasing their toxic exposure because this is a big journey and we're all going to have to take some kind of a stand to protect ourselves. That was Dr. Diane Sandler. She is the developer of Cellular Yoga, and her website is diannesandler.com. Dr. Sandler wanted the people in and around Porter Ranch to know that if you are manifesting symptoms of benzene poisoning, you must go immediately to get medical care at a hospital emergency room or by calling 911. For our second interview, another of my favorite people, Kimberly Roberson is a certified nutrition educator, a former Greenpeace nuclear campaigner, the founder of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, and the author of Silent Deafening, Fukushima Fallout, A Mother's Response. The following interview focuses on radiation from Fukushima and its impact on the food chain. But what she shares has implications for protection from radon and radon decay products as well. Kimberly and I have worked together extensively on developing a program of best practices to help safeguard against nuclear radiation, and many of the actions we came up with are applicable to residents of Porter Ranch, North St. Louis around the Westlake Landfill and Coldwater Creek, and any place where people are exposed to radiation or industrial toxins. Our work led us to create a new audio program called RAPT, Radiation Awareness Protection Talk, and we'll let you know about that, too. Kimberly, thanks for joining me. Well, thanks, Libby. It's great to be here, and I am a huge fan of Nuclear Hot Seat, so thanks for everything you're doing. You know, I lived through the anti-Russian nuclear propaganda of the 1950s Cold War. That was when we were told the truth about radiation's dangers because it was going to be coming from the Russians, and the Russians were bad. Then in 1979, I experienced the terror firsthand of being only one mile from the Three Mile Island nuclear accident as it was unfolding. So when Fukushima and the nuclear disaster there began on March 11 of 2011, I was already sensitized to the dangers of nuclear. I knew that as terrible as the earthquake and tsunami had been, the impact of nuclear radiation on health and life would be even more devastating and long-lasting. Food and water safety came immediately to mind. Now, I had not been an activist on the issue at that point, so I didn't know anyone else even thinking about that ongoing problem. And that's why, less than one month after Fukushima began, I was surprised and relieved to encounter a lengthy Facebook post by someone writing clearly and powerfully about the dangers posed to the food chain and our water supply. That post was written by you, Kimberly Roberson. So first, I want to explore what brought you to such an immediate awareness of the food safety issue after Fukushima and motivated you to write that first Facebook post. 
Well, everything was really converging in that moment when I learned on March 11th of 2011 what was happening in Japan because I have a background in both anti-nuclear activism and holistic nutrition. So when Fukushima started, I began to connect the dots pretty quickly, as you can imagine. And back in the 90s, I was part of the Word Valley Coalition, and that was a very united powerful group that fought and defeated the proposed low-level radioactive dump in Southern California, which happened to be above an underground aquifer adjacent to the Colorado River, unlined trenches for so-called low-level radioactive waste. And this water system is part of much of the drinking and agricultural water for the western United States. So all of us in the coalition got a first-hand education on what so-called low-level radiation really is and that it is far from harmless, especially for kids and pregnant and nursing moms. When they told us not to worry about Fukushima, I didn't listen. And when they said mostly nothing at all, the silence was truly deafening. I had always planned on returning to work in the nutrition field after my son started back to school, but Fukushima made me doubt that that could ever happen. And the more I found out about the problem, the more I knew in my heart that it wouldn't be possible to counsel someone on the merits of eating, say, an organic diet, understanding now that even foods thought to be the healthiest, like organic and others, can potentially be contaminated with radioactive fallout from Fukushima. So this really sacred system of belief that I have was seriously threatened. And not only did I mourn what was happening to the planet and its inhabitants, but also what I thought was the loss of a profession that I really treasured. And after 10 years of working in that profession, there was a lot of mourning there. So I tried to turn that around as best as I could into proactive work. You also wrote a book that touches on these issues from a personal perspective. Yes, I did. But, you know, I never intended to write a book. It never even crossed my mind. It kind of grew somewhat organically. Someone said that once to me, and it really stuck in my mind. I was asked to write an article about the first food monitoring petition that I wrote back on April 1st of 2011. And that was how you and I met, Libby. You read the article online. It was on Dr. Helen Caldicott's Nuclear Free Planet website. And you wrote in the comments section that you thought it would be a good ebook. And I remember thinking, well, that's really nice that she thinks that, but no way. I'm not, I can't do that. But it stuck in my mind, you know, as those things do. And once the ebook was completed, Someone else asked for it to be in a print edition. They could actually have a book to hold. And then it was published with Vision Talk. So the whole process really took on a life of its own. And it was reissued as a second edition, and it will probably go into a third run as well. But I've always really considered it like it had a life of its own. I was just the conduit for the information. And the book is actually a, a diary of events as they unfolded around Fukushima in 2011 and 2012 the deafening silence that to this day on many levels surrounds this issue. And it's also a call to action to everyone, but especially to parents and grandparents who are unfamiliar or outright misguided about nuclear power's effects on human health and future generations. What led you to found SAN, Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network, and what is the stated purpose of the group? Who is it for? Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network formed around that first food monitoring petition I mentioned. And thanks to the encouragement of some trusted friends, I felt empowered to contact some of the people I used to work with and really admired. It was always with the people that I just really, really enjoyed working with in the past and kind of considered them to be like a dream team. But all the time that I was doing that, I was always in the back of my mind that a major group would come along and take this on, like an established national group. And it, to date, hasn't happened. No matter how important this is, let's make no mistake about it, this is really another way of internal contamination to our bodies. You know, this is internal exposure via food consumption, food and water. And internal contamination is, without a doubt, the most harmful type of exposure to radiation. It's cumulative, and it's extremely destructive. It's a real complex issue. It's an elephant in the room that groups really weren't and still aren't ready to deal with head on. So that's one piece of it that I feel significant to mention. You know, we just, it was kind of like necessity being the mother of invention. And I kept hearing from well-established groups that they didn't have the bandwidth. I heard that word a lot. They had their own agendas and boards and budgets. And to be fair, this is a world where we have so many extremely difficult 
challenges already, the climate change, the GMO, and many others. So we were able still to, to pull together a group of pretty, I would say, very impressive people. And our mission is simply to protect and improve the food and water quality in the United States due to the Fukushima disaster and to work with people in Japan to help them as well. Tell us about the petition Singh put out. The petition was filed with the United States Food and Drug Administration back on March 12th of 2013, and it calls for a significant reduction in the current allowable levels of cesium-134 and 137 in food, nutritional supplements, and pharmaceuticals. Currently, the U.S. has the highest allowable levels for radioactive cesium in the world, and basically what it boils down to is that it's a huge loophole that has never been addressed before. Some people think that the FDA raised allowable levels after Fukushima started, but that's not true. That was EPA and water. What FDA has done, they established such an incredibly high level to begin with that it didn't need to be raised. That level is 1,200 becquerel per kilogram. Now, a becquerel is one atomic disintegration per second. A kilogram is roughly two and a half pounds of food, say in this case spinach. 1,200 becquerel per kilogram of cesium-134 and 137 of food in the U.S., as opposed to 100 becquerel per kilogram of cesium in food in Japan, which is still enough to qualify it as nuclear waste. Japan is the only group currently working to improve food policy in the U.S. due to Fukushima and man-made radiation in our food supply. And I wanted to mention, too, that the cesium-134 and 137 are two radionuclides that indicate that many others are present. So even though it seems like there's, it's only testing for two, it's like the canary in a coal mine. Where there's one, even, there are many, many others. I also wanted to be sure to mention that there's a signing petition to the FDA comment petition also. Both of our petitions are at www.ffan.us. The citizen petition is for commenting. It takes a few minutes to do. The signing petition takes just a few seconds. And, of course, I will have links up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. Now, I want to let listeners know that, Kim, you became an early interviewee for Nuclear Hot Seat and have been a recurring guest, as well as a source for background information every time an issue came up dealing with food safety. I would call you, discuss the information I found online, and work with you to figure out whether it was reliable or not before passing it along as part of the program. It's just the level of research that I do. So from the beginning, both you and I shared a proactive approach to taking care of our health, despite contradictions from others who said there was nothing that could be done. So, Kim, as a certified nutrition educator, what do you say to those who maintain that there is no way to protect from radiation and that it's counterproductive to our movement to tell people that it is possible? You know, Libby, that's a great question. A lot of this information has been coming out due to our research and others, too, and it wasn't really readily apparent back in March of 2011 what could be done. But in the years that have followed, we realized that there has been a lot of research by Bandashevsky, Yablokov, and others about the effects of radiation on human health and our food. So learning that has been very empowering. And all along, I felt that it's just going to be one step at a time, even from the early days where I was the lady in the store, you know, looking for anything predated March of 2011, you know, a little voice in my head just said, look, just keep trying one day at a time, more will be revealed. And it's really a quality of life issue. And I've been inspired by history and situations where people organized and survived in really daunting situations. To not be afraid of the truth, to not be afraid to fight, and to work for what's best. And in a sense, this is just the tip of the iceberg. Fukushima has opened up a huge kind of Pandora's box on what the nuclear industry has been doing to our food and water around the globe. As a parent, there was no way I was capable of accepting that we can't do better for our kids and ourselves. We're responsible for children. We need to work hard to find ways to keep them as healthy as possible. And don't forget that this radioactivity is transgenerational DNA damage causing. It doesn't just affect one child going down the ancestral line. It's the child's 
child and a child's child's child. It goes on for generations. Dr. Ridley Bertel wrote extensively about that. What are some steps that we can take? There are some obvious things to do, like filtering our water, but some others aren't so obvious. For instance, edible clays and zeolite have been used for thousands of years by people to feel healthy, to feel better, to have more stamina, without really understanding, of course, what the scientific reasons were for that happening. But now we know why they work. Again, Bandashevsky and Yablokov, we know that there were things that they discovered through their research that significantly helped people. One example, in the Belarus region, during and after the Chernobyl nuclear crisis, which actually I shouldn't say after, it's ongoing as well. That's where they used zeolite, both in capsule form for the liquidators and also baked into cookies for the children. Another example is lessons learned as far back as Nagasaki, where after that horrific bomb blast, people who survived that were under the care of a doctor about 25 kilometers away. I can't remember exactly. I write about it in the book. And it was at St. Francis Hospital, and he was able to keep every patient in the hospital healthy, away from radiation poisoning. No one had radiation poisoning if they avoided sugar and ate a macrobiotic diet. Fascinating, fascinating stuff. So there are things that people can do. And as I explained in Silence Deafening, it's not enough to just take care of ourselves and our own families. Change has to happen with how we create energy in our world so that there are no more Fukushimas. I mean, we have to transition as soon as possible to safe energy sources. Some say we've passed the tipping point, and others disagree with that. But no matter how you look at it, it isn't just enough to take care of ourselves. We have to fully transition as soon as possible to renewable energy. Very well said, Kim. And it was our shared concern that led us to create a program that we call RAPT, which stands for Radiation Awareness Protection Talk. I found that there's a lot of fear and confusion in the general population about food safety, supplementation, and just generally how to take care of one's health in the face of the threat of radiation from Fukushima and elsewhere. From the start on Nuclear Hot Seat, I included radiation protection tips and interviews with people such as yourself who focused on food safety issues. I'm a good researcher online, and I did have the thought of compiling that information into a book or a seminar-type program, only, quite frankly, I didn't have a nutritionist's credentials to support what my research was showing. And during that time, the first three years after Fukushima started, I compiled as much information as possible. And when it became clear that the situation was getting worse with no end in sight and that the process of changing policy in the United States was going to take longer than I had hoped, working through agencies. I actually had to start looking at what I could best do in the moment, and I started a master list of the most proven proactive measures for helping to best guard our health against the effects of radiation. And we all know that in addition to radiation, there are many other food issues, including toxins, pesticides, GMOs. A lot of people are realizing now about the spraying that happens with chemtrails, the heavy metals involved in that, so many of these issues can be addressed simultaneously by taking the steps that we outline in the RAPT program. What are the top three points you think people need to understand to get a handle on the magnitude of the problem we face regarding radiation and the food supply and the need to take steps to further protect ourselves? Three things. One, we must close the radioactive loophole that I mentioned earlier here in the U.S., by significantly lower the levels of radioactive cesium and other radionuclides in our food supply. Number two, understand that once it's in the food chain, it's there for millions of years. So we must adapt to this new understanding, and we do that by educating ourselves as best as possible and not being afraid, not turning a blind eye. Number three, ingesting radionuclides can lead to transgenerational DNA damage, infertility, birth defects, heart disease, diabetes, cancer, and more. So we need to take it on with clarity and with honesty and not be afraid. In addition, it's not just Fukushima that exposes us to the dangers of nuclear radiation. If you live within 50 miles of a functioning nuclear reactor or decommissioned nuclear reactor even, which stores a vast amount of radioactive waste on site, 
you were at danger of exposure. If you live near any site used in the development of the atom bombs used at Hiroshima or Nagasaki, all of which still store radioactive waste on site. If you're near uranium mines, whether they are in active use or not, because the tailings are stored around which are radioactive and dust can be picked up and blown great distances. And then there are rainouts of radiation from the jet stream, which still contains radioactive particles from all the atmospheric tests and explosions that have ever taken place. And that includes the explosion that took place at Fukushima. So while some areas may be marginally better than others, to be honest, we are all at some degree of risk from exposure to radiation. Now, around the third anniversary of Fukushima, Kim and I, you and I, decided to turn what we were learning for ourselves into a program that we could provide as a service to others so that the best quality information we had discovered could be made available to the community and beyond. So we created the Radiation Awareness Protection Talk Program. In Wrapped, we created three audios, approximately one hour each, that cover conscious food choices, foods to avoid, and those that help support our immune system best, supplementation, detoxification, and healthy immune support, water and air purification, how to deal with gardens, pets, and general nuclear home hygiene, how to take the best possible care of your living environment, and recommended products, including a specific purified liquid zeolite that we have determined is the best quality available on the market and the, by far the most effective. That's what we have available in the first three audios. And in addition, RAFT comes with three bonus audios, which are an explanation of what radiation is and why it's so dangerous to our health, what to do in case of a nuclear emergency, and how to get information on food source safely directly from manufacturers with a full script to follow. RAT is intended primarily for those who know enough to be concerned but do not yet have a clear understanding of what they can do to protect their health. The RAT program will also prove useful to those who may have already researched for themselves and are always looking to expand their information base. But there are people who know nothing of how to protect themselves. They don't even know that they need to protect themselves and their families. They don't know where to look, and they want the information from a source that they can trust where there is such a glut of free information available on the Internet. Very good points, Levy. And also mothers and fathers, women who are pregnant or want to become pregnant, mothers who are nursing, those who are compromised with immune system difficulties or chronic diseases, and, of course, the elderly. They're so overlooked in our society. They're such valuable family members and parts of our community, and they're more susceptible to radiation dangers as well. And also health professionals who have been avoiding the issue out of confusion or fear or just not knowing about it at all. RAPT can help them adjust key protocols for health so that the very best information is made available to their patients and clients. And, again, I did not know personally how I would ever be able to continue working in the field of nutrition knowing what Fukushima was doing to our food supply. But with RAPT, there are some very basic plans that will enhance any client or patient protocol. So if you are a health professional, be it holistic or allopathic, please feel free to contact us for more information. That was Kimberly Roberson of Fukushima Fallout Awareness Network and so much more. You can contact Kim through the fan page on Facebook or through their website, ffan.us. RAPT is available at raptawareness.com. That's R-A-P like Peter, T like Tom, awareness.com. And when you go there, be sure you sign up for our free special report, Seven Misconceptions About Radiation and Immune System Risks, and the number one way to help protect the health of you and your loved ones. Again, it's available at raptawareness.com. Activist shout-out! Congratulations to Fairwinds Energy Education Services for getting their podcast back up and running again. Fairwinds is home base to Arnie Gunderson and Maggie Gunderson, who have been reliable sources of science-based, engineering-based information about Fukushima, Vermont Yankee, San Onofre, 
many other reactors, and the entire nuclear situation that we face worldwide. Their information is always brilliantly researched, scientifically verifiable, cutting edge, and easy to understand. That last one's the hard part. So check them out and sign up for email notification when each new podcast is posted. You can do this by going to fairwinds.org, which is F like Frank, A-I-R-E, winds.org. Scroll down, and on the right-hand column, you'll see subscribe to our podcast as a button that's just waiting for you to click on it. Also, there's a new feature on the Nuclear Hot Seat website, which I'm calling the Missing Link. It's a list of articles too long or elaborate to go into as part of the newscast, but of interest to many listeners. So from now on, whenever I say I'm going to link to an article or video, all the links will be available under the episode. Just look for the green headline and click away to your heart's content. Here's today's final thought. Last Friday, January 22nd, I attended a town hall meeting about the ongoing Porter Ranch gas leak disaster. Three hours of intense information from attorneys, including Robert F. Kennedy Jr., doctors, a veterinary toxicologist, a realtor, local residents, and not one word about radon gas. Now, admittedly, these people are on overwhelm. And the attorneys certainly have their hands full with more immediate problems than the potential for lung cancer 20 to 30 years from now or the impact of radon's decay product lead to 10 with a half-life of 22.3 years. It's hard to wrap one's head around the arcane projections of future damage from nuclear radiation when kids and pets are bleeding out their noses from toxic chemical pollution. Now, from my perspective... To ignore the radon problem is a mistake. But to ignore what is happening to those people emotionally and spiritually is perhaps a bigger mistake. They are in an existential crisis of the highest order. Porter Ranch is not a cheap place to buy a home. So the people there can be assumed to have the funds to have some options in the world. Certainly they are not used to being inconvenienced, let alone at this level, but it's hard to change one's world view quickly. After the town hall, in the parking structure, an attractive mom in her late thirties compulsively showed me smartphone photos of her 16-year-old son and the blood clots that had been sloughing out of his nose. She said he'd also had trouble breathing and had almost died, that his lungs were so badly scarred by the toxic fumes he'd been inhaling, that they were the lungs of a very old man. She said her house was only one mile from the gas leak. They'd held off relocating until just the week before, because they were waiting for things to get better, or at least for relocation money to come through. She was hurt and angry and scared, but still she assumed that even in a disaster it would be business as presumed usual. She had not yet been able to adjust her understanding of her new place, her family's new place in the world, a place where money made no difference. She might as well have been living in Flint. This is what I saw on the faces of the Porter Ranch residents in that meeting, a level of bewilderment and hurt and anger. They don't understand how this could have happened to them. This is the kind of thing that happens to other people, not them. Except it has. And now they are being forced to go through the lifting of the veil to learn the real reality of our world, how broken the governmental system really is, and that it is not going to come to their rescue and protection. They have no privilege. It's a shock especially for people who are used to living within the system and having it work for them. What I want to say to the people of Porter Ranch is this. You have been recruited, without your intention or consent, into an awareness of just how awful things are. Not only what's happening to you now, 
but how badly the system has been broken, for how long, how much our government has been pretending, fooling you, lying, directing your awareness from what's happening all around you. I know. I would not be involved with nuclear issues, but I found myself one mile from Three Mile Island, and it took me close to 30 years to wrap my head around that statement. Since Fukushima, I've been watching from the nuclear perspective for almost five years, and the games being played with your lives and safety are the same as the ones that get played on anyone who comes within the path of the nuclear industry juggernaut. Yes, it's a shock to realize how you have been victimized by the very government agencies and utilities tasked with keeping you safe. This is something that victims of Fukushima, Chernobyl, Westlake Landfill, Cold Water Creek, all the nuclear accidents and incidents around the world have known about and been forced to live with for a very long time. You've been absolutely convinced of your safety until now when you have been forced to see that lying little man behind the curtain. Now you are being assaulted, battered, perpetrated against by Southern California Gas Company and the government agencies that were supposed to regulate it. What you are witnessing and experiencing is persistent, systemic, psychotic incompetence. Incompetence elevated to the level of corporate and governmental culture. There is no check and balance in place. No national citizens watchdog agency empowered to scrutinize these institutions and call them out on their crimes against humans and other living things, if not humanity itself. Nothing exists within our system to keep Southern California Gas, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the Environmental Protection Agency, California Public Utilities Commission, or all the other acronymic agencies in good working order, genuinely protecting people and the environment. And there's no way yet to hold their feet to the fire if they are not doing their job. It's like they've all got tenure and are thumbing their noses. And now they're caught and embarrassed, but really, so what? Nobody chooses the path to such an uncomfortable awareness. Whether you are at Porter Ranch or Westlake Landfill or the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant in Carlsbad, New Mexico or Numec in Apollo, Pennsylvania, with toxic exposure and health breakdowns and relocation and reimbursement challenges and lawsuits and emotional upheaval, the most disruptive thing that has changed in your lives is your perspective on the reality in which you live. It is a bitter pill to swallow that the government you were raised to trust and revere will not protect you, as it truly has not protected you for years. The agencies providing service will lie to protect their bottom line, not your life. You, in the individual, are expendable, like the people in Flint or North St. Louis or so many other places that have been deemed expendable, left to be managed but not given either satisfaction or justice. And all the lawyers and all the town meetings are just scrambling to make up for what's been in place for a long time, and they can't even come close. The only thing for you to do is to first take the time and space and awareness to let yourself have the emotions at hand. Do it in a safe way, time, and space. The middle of traffic on the 405 is not it. Take care of your health and the health of your loved ones. Move away from the danger if you can. Don't wait for money or relocation or any assistance. If you can, get out. And if you can't, get air filters now. Don't wait for the gas company to get one on back order and install it. You don't have the time. Then get angry. Get really angry in a way that's going to serve you in the long run. Fight back against the perpetrators and don't stop fighting. Do not take any false assurances that you are not in harm's way because you are.
You have been. You just haven't been aware of it. Now that you know, do what you can. And one last thing. Do not make the mistake of thinking that you are alone and that you have to invent this activist wheel all by yourselves. There are experienced activists in your midst. There are movements to model on and models for taking action that you can use to coordinate your response. You have just been recruited into the battle for sanity, safety, and to make those who have made the mistakes of the past take responsibility for them and do everything in their power to put it as right as possible. You are not just fighting for you and your family right now, but for all the genetic future generations you and so many others hope to be able to have. To use a term from the nuclear movement, you are all now downwinders, collateral damage. I am so, so sorry that you are in this situation, being hurt in this way, and have had your lives turned upside down in such a devastating manner. I wish I could tell you that a day will come when things will return to normal, but they won't. Ever. This is the new normal. Welcome to your new reality. Welcome to the fight. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat for Tuesday, January 26, 2016. Material for this week's show has been researched and compiled from enenews.com, plats.com, world.einnews.com, syracuse.com, powermag.com, comonews.com, cbslocal.com, Forbes, hcn.org, Albuquerque Journal, tricityherald.com, counterpunch.org, kdhnews.com, washingtonpost.com, ecowatch.com, kyotonews.jp, businesswire, fukushima-diary.org, Com, and our friend Iori Mochizuki, nuclear-news.net, Stop the Great Lakes Nuclear Dump, IndiaResists.com, the local.fr, the Guardian.com, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the karmically challenged cubicle drones at worldnuclearnews.org, and the fabulous Nuclear Hot Seat community on Facebook and beyond, which you are all invited to visit and to like. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weber. Accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV on StuWebRadioNetwork.com, formerly Veterans Truth Network, in New Zealand by NewZSentinel.com, and ActivateMedia.org. We're always looking for other networks to connect with, so if you know of a news aggregator that would like to carry this show, do put us in touch. Check out the archive, everyone. You can find it on iTunes under podcasts, under the website, nuclearhotseat.com, and on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos. And a final reminder that your contributions help keep Nuclear Hot Seat going and growing, so please, if you can, when you can, at least buy us the equivalent of a cup of Starbucks this week to help us out. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues, so if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, Reminding you that we've all had our nuclear wake-up call. Now, don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. Nuclear hot seat, what are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat, what have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat, the corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat. It's the bomb.